Thank you very much um, to Weatherhead and Columbia for the opportunity to be a part of this um, very impressive day of panels. It's kind of a challenge to go last, um, so I'm going to try to be very quick. Um, I know it's been a long day. Um, what we've heard um, from Professor Sachs and, and my colleagues up here um, are that you know there's a lot of problems um, in China right now. Um, and I think to a lot of Chinese people um, and the young people that I work with, sometimes they seem insurmountable and, and um, depressing. Um, but what my organization um, does is we try to um, we try to encourage young people to think about what they can do and how they can contribute and to um, gain uh, confidence and encouragement from, from their activities. Um, so I, I'm going to talk about, in general, um, in education for sustainable development um, and specifically about the projects that I work on. Um, what, in, in my definition, personally, I think education for sustainable development means that we just have to make everybody in society aware about all of the issues associated with sustainable development that have been mentioned today. Everything from climate change, public health, um, HIV and AIDS, all of these issues um, that are related to how we can change our development path to one that will be more sustainable. Um, I work for Dr. Jane Goodall, um, and she, her theory on um, education for sustainable development is that, um, in general, the older generations, um, it's going to be very difficult to change our habits and the way that we're used to doing things. But if we can, if we can take the opportunity to to influence young people and to change the way that they look at the world, the way that they run their lives and the habits they have. Um, we're going to be much better off in, in a very few years because they are the future leaders. So um, <clears throat> Dr. Goodall founded the Roots and Shoots Environmental Education Program. And what Roots and Shoots does is it focuses on after school activities, um, creating spaces for young people to look at uh, environmental or wildlife or animal issues that are very close to their communities and researching those um, designing projects, taking action. And the theory is that when young people get active and are involved in small scale projects in their own communities, they will see the results of their efforts. And then those young people will have the attitude that each one of us actually can make a difference. So they won't have the attitude that a lot of our older generations have, which is, what can I do? I'm just an individual. So the idea is that we're trying to change the attitudes of people to, to understand that actually everybody can make a difference by changing a few of your habits or doing something you know each each day or joining an event once a month or something like that. Um, in China we did a with the help of some SEPA students actually, we did an evaluation of our program um, in nineteen in, in two thousand and seven and we found that um, for the students who got involved in roots and shoots, um, not only did they, were they considered themselves very aware of environmental issues, but they actually um, were motivated to talk to other people and help change other people's attitudes and help change other people's habits. So um, we're, we're, we're changing the young people of China. Um, we're, we're helping them to understand that they can all play a role um, and they should all get involved. Um, however, um, you know, as a nonprofit in China, we're very limited in the scale that we can reach. But I'll, I'll get into that in a, in a minute. Um, the British Council here in China recently did a survey of public opinion, and they found and they surveyed. Uh, I think it was 18 to 35 year olds. So they were looking at young people, and they found that um, people, young people, were aware of, especially of the slogans that the government has put out there. You know. Uh, Green Olympics, and we want to be environmental, and we want to live in harmony with the environment, and these kinds of things. They're certainly aware of it, um, but when they were asked the question, would you be willing to sacrifice or compromise your own personal um, welfare for, in order to benefit the environment, would you be willing to give up the idea of owning a car or something like that? The answer was no um, for the vast majority. Um, so, you know, it, it's understandable. Of course, they're not going to be willing to. China's growing, China's developing, and everybody wants a part of it. Um, but what we're trying to do is um, 
give, is give people the idea, um, focusing on the young people, that, that we can all do something different. So um, we do everything from training teachers um, in how to lead a group of young people outside of the classroom. Um, this is a very new concept in China because, as many of you know, the traditional education system is very teacher instructive and students don't ask questions and they're not challenging the teachers and they're not raising their hands. Um, and they don't have the space to be to develop their creativity and develop their leadership skills. So what we're trying to do is train Chinese teachers um, in how to do this uh, through after school activities because influencing or changing the, the Chinese curriculum is uh, very difficult. Um, it's, it's very strictly, tightly controlled by the central government. Um, so we're going through, through the after school approach um, and really showing teachers how to take a step back, let young people run their own club, design their own projects, and come to you when they need you for specific you know, needs, um, like getting permission maybe to go into a neighborhood and do an awareness campaign or something. Um, so the, the teachers um, recognize um, that, we, that our program offers this because they're told that the central government now wants Chinese education system to allow for more creativity and to encourage students to be innovative. But the teachers don't know how to do that because they've never seen it done. They've never had that experience in the classroom themselves, and their training didn't really include that. Um, so that's one niche that we're filling in a way, is that we're showing Chinese teachers that this is one way um, that they can um, develop their students' creativity and leadership skills um, through after school mm -hmm. activities while also making an impact on the local environment. Um, we're working both in urban and rural areas. Um, the two approaches are, are very different, of course. Um, teachers in the urban areas have far more resources than in the rural areas, and the teachers in the rural areas um, are barely trained in the knowledge that they need to give to their students, never mind um, ideas like developing students' creativity or leadership skills. Um, so with the urban teachers, we're, we're able to kind of give them a training and, follow, and opportunities to follow up with us, but really let them run with it. Um, whereas in rural areas, we, we try to work much more close, much closer with, this, with the teachers, um, uh, creating programs that they can join um, so that they're not left on their own to, to help support these clubs of students. Um, sometimes it's not needed. Sometimes, sometimes you get a group of rural students um, or urban students who, who really don't even need the teacher. Um, as you know, another interesting thing about this, this time that we're working in is that all of these kids, well, most of them, are single children in the home. So they already have um, developed a leadership in a way um, because they're bossing their parents around, <laughs> a lot of them. And another interesting thing about the way that we work too is, is that when we influence one child, we count on the fact that they're going home and influencing two parents and four grandparents because all of these people, these six adults, are doting on this one child, um, especially in the urban areas where um, there are single child families. Um, so this is a kind of a, the way that we're working um, in China, and there's a lot more that I'd be happy to tell you about um, in, you know, later on in the reception or in the question session. Um, but I just wanted to, to talk a little bit about the situation for a nonprofit as ourselves working in China. Um, as many of you know, the, the government rules about nonprofits are very vague. It basically says that you have to have a government bureau sponsor your registration with the Ministry of Civil Affairs. And for most organizations, that's an impossible hurdle. Um, getting a, a government official to put their neck on the line for you, um, because if you do, if your organization does anything illegal or, or anything crazy, then, then they're gonna be the ones who, who take the fall. Um, it, it's not um, feasible. So what we do is we all, all these NGOs now, there's hundreds of them working in Beijing, we've all figured out how to work around it. Um, the example of my institute for, as an example, is that we have um, for years operated under the umbrella of one of the international schools, which was actually registered as a nonprofit educational institute. So we were able to, to work in a nonprofit way and, and you know, give a receipt to donors that says that they made a donation to a nonprofit. Um, 
but it was, but we couldn't put our own name on that receipt. It had to be the name of this international school. And then recently, um, we registered a local company with a very minimal investment, and four Chinese friends put their name on the company. Um, and so, in that sense, we have to pay taxes. So we get donations from companies um, to support the Roots and program, but we have to pay taxes on those donations, which is unfortunate. Um, NGOs in China are playing all kinds of roles contributing to, to sustainability. And what my personal feeling about the organization I work for is that we've shown that we're doing a great job. We've shown that we're making a difference and impacting these young people to have a new attitude and do things differently. Um, but we're limited in the scale that we can reach because of the government's limitations on our um, registration and the way that we have to operate. Um, we also have a hard time uh, working with the government because they're, in general, suspicious of nonprofits. So if we could, various government officials have unofficially recognized us and said, you're doing a great job and we want to work with you. But they can't work with us on a, on a large scale because they have, they're, they're limited in their interactions with nonprofits. So um, that's what the, I wanted to say today. Thank you very much.